Welcome everyone to Chicago Autism Network's virtual parent workshop. Tonight we have Terry Boss presenting to us on sensory processing and regulation. Terry Boss is a school-based occupational therapist and she was one of the first people to present at these virtual workshops. So we are glad to have her back and we'll turn the time over to Terry. Thank you. All right, I can't multitask so I'm gonna share my screen and then I will start talking here. Oops, that's not what I meant. Oh, I did it again. I really have done this before. All right, can you see it, Kimmy? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, so hello, everybody. Welcome, I wanna welcome, and um, I want to acknowledge just right away that this is built. I work at a special education co-op, and it's built in collaboration with some occupational therapists that I work with. Um, I am fine with things being very informal. Um, I am totally open to questions, even if it's mid sentence or you can put it in the chat. Um, if something, if you wanna stop me in the middle, otherwise I'm happy to answer questions at the end as well. So Kimmy, feel free to, to catch me if you need to mid, um, mid presentation. Um, my, the objectives for today is I'd like to talk about, about the sensory system and how it evolves. I think that's a really good kind of baseline before we look at things like sensory processing disorder and self-regulation as it relates to autism. And then I'm hoping to give some strategies in the home and community and, um, answer any questions that you have. Mm -hmm. Trying to turn, uh... Hold on, my slide won't move. Let's see. There we go. All right. So um, I have been an occupational therapist for over 15 years. I have worked with private clients, um, mostly with autism, but the majority of my experience has been in the school system in pediatrics. I tried to change a lot of my slides and talk about children instead of students. But if you see um, or you hear that sneak in, you know where it came from. Um, I'm currently the OT coordinator, my, my special education co-op. We have 43 OTs that work in my co-op. So um, what that means is I I have access to a lot of great ideas from a lot of OTs. Um, and typically I work with students of ages three to 22. So that's kind of my sweet spot. But I do think if you happen to have a kiddo that's at a younger age, I think, you know, understanding the development from birth is really kind of key to the topic we're talking about today. Um, sensory processing. So what is sensory processing? Um, it's a neurological process, right? So even though our eyes, our ears, our skin, taking in all that information, the real sensory processing is happening in our brain. Um, and we are constantly taking in sensory information. And when I say constantly, that means from all systems at all times. And what our brains do are they organize and integrate the sensation so it becomes meaningful to us. Um, normal sensory integration allows us to respond to the sensory input we receive automatically, efficiently, and comfortable. So uh, here's my example. Um, I take 290 often when I'm going to pick my kids up. So it's a beautiful day. I have my windows down like it was this afternoon. And all of a sudden, my smelling sensation picks up a horrible smell. I look around. I see a garbage truck. I'm in bumper to bumper traffic. I'm like, oh my gosh, oh no, I shut my windows, right? So that would be an example of me taking in information, making sense of it, and then responding. Um, so that's really what sensory processing is. Um, but I think it's really important to talk about the fact that we all have very different levels of sensing, like how much we notice it, and also liking and disliking. And that is across all of our senses. So um, you know, there's every sensation is kind of on a spectrum where some people are really like it and some people really dislike it and some people really notice it and some people really don't. And I think that's important just to understand it. It'll, it'll kind of come up again and again is that it's OK to have very different sensory processing. In fact, we all do. I said we all have sensory issues. Mine in particular is styrofoam. If you if I hear styrofoam or I touch styrofoam, I will act very strangely. Um, but I can handle other 
sensation, like, you know, nails on a chalkboard, that doesn't really bother me. So it's all kind of relative to everyone. I just want to make sure and emphasize we all can respond in a numerous ways. And we'll talk a little bit more in depth about when that becomes a disorder. Um, so we have five familiar senses. Hopefully everyone learned those five senses. Um, you know, I have the technical names on there. Instead of hearing, it's auditory for sound. Instead of taste, it's gustatory. And instead of smell, it's called olfactory, et cetera, et cetera. Um, tactile, which is touch. I just want to um, it says on the slide, it's information through your hands and your skin, but actually we have tactile sensation in our mouth as well. When you feel with your tongue, a, a, a texture or, uh, how much food is in your mouth, that is tactile as well, just because I know that often can be an issue. So that doesn't fall under the taste. It falls under tactile. So, um, those are the familiar senses, hopefully that we've all heard of. Um, but we have two hidden senses that are really, really important um, for a lot of reasons. And those are vestibular, which is information about movement through our inner ear. And really it's where our head is in relation to our body and the earth and proprioceptive. And that is information from all of our joints. So muscles, ligaments, tendons, those all have receptors. That's proprioceptive. So I'm going to go into that with a little more detail. Um, so vestibular sense, I said, is the sense of, of orientation, your head's orientation specifically, and movement. Um, so there are receptors in your inner ear. They are actually, think of little um, blocks. There are little blocks in fluid in your inner ear. And just like when you move a snow globe back and forth, and things inside move, that's what happens when you move your head back and forth in, with these little blocks in the fluid. And that's what sensation tells your brain. So for example, um, you know, when I move to the left, the blocks kind of flatten out that way in that sense. So even if my eyes were shut, I would still know what my head position was. Um, it also develops our relationship to the earth. I kind of talked about that. So I don't know if everyone has been on a roller coaster, but if you got on a really big roller coaster that went upside down and you shut your eyes from the moment you buckled in through the whole roller coaster, you would know without a doubt when you were upside down, right? You wouldn't need your eyes to tell you you were upside down. And that is vestibular sense. That's the sense that you know, you feel gravity, you feel that your head is below you. Um, so when you think about vestibular, think about things that really move your head in space quickly. So jumping, handstands, cartwheels, swings, those are all kinds of, of things that use your vestibular sense um, or really kind of um, push your vestibular sense a little bit. Um, interestingly enough, um, motion sickness also relates to your vestibular sense. Um, and probably nobody is that interested in it except for me, but because I love to talk about it because it makes so much sense. When you are in a car, let's say, and you're moving, your blocks in your ear, your ossicles, feel that movement. And they say to your brain, you're moving. But if you're looking at a book inside the car, or then your eyes are saying, because the book is moving at the exact same rate as your body, your eyes are saying, no, you're staying still. And motion sickness is about a, um, a disconnection of signals to your brain. So I think that sometimes helps people kind of understand. So that's vestibular sense, which is one of those hidden senses that's really important. And the other one is proprioception. Um, so that is your body position. So if everyone shut their eyes right now, and I told you to put your hands straight out to the side, like you were standing in a letter T, you know how to do that. And the reason you know when your hands are straight out is proprioceptive. It's that the muscles and the joints in your core and also in your shoulder joints tell you when you have reached kind of 90 degrees and you're standing in that position. So basically those receptors are telling your muscles when they're moving in one direction or not, when they're contracting, when they're using force, when they're bending, all of those things. And that enables your brain to know how your body's moving. So that's the same thing that let's say you're walking down a hallway and somebody's walking towards you. You don't have to move all, you don't have to stop where you are and let them go by you. Your proprioceptive sense lets you know, oh, just move, you know, a foot and a half to the left and you won't hit them because that's your awareness of body and space. 
Um, so uh, another thing that I like to tell people is not just kind of think of a crowded hallway, but think of um, one of the interesting fun facts I heard was that bas professional basketball players have the best proprioceptive sense in the world because they are off the ground and they are able to move every joint from, you know, from their shoulder to their elbow, to their wrist, to their fingertips in exactly the right position. They know exactly how to use which muscle to hit a shot. I mean, think of Michael Jordan, um, you know, or, or, you know, LeBron, Kobe, whatever, if you want to update it from my Michael Jordan reference, they can, they can do that in midair without any, um, without missing very often, right? Because it's such a refined proprioceptive sense. Now we're going to talk a little bit about when babies are born and their proprioceptive sense is the opposite of really developed like an MLB player. Um, so this slide talks about the fact that along with touch, which is one of the really fundamental ways that, that really development happens for babies, vestibular sense, your vestibular um, awareness and your proprioception help develop everything for a uh, kiddo. Uh, for a baby, most of what they learn, and I think it's something like the first six months is really only related to those systems. Um, so think about rolling over, right? That's vestibular sense. Think about reaching. That requires your proprioceptive. Think about putting things in your mouth. That's tactile. That those refining those senses are really what they spend the most of their time doing. Um, and really it, it's true for all the systems, not just those three, that systems get more refined the more information they get. And by raw, I mean, they're not good at recognizing it, right? Um, when you have a baby, you have to get really close to them or show them something really close to notice. They're, it's raw. It's not ready to see something across the room and in you know a small picture. It has to be big and exciting. Also, when you think about those two important hidden senses, um, when a baby wants to be calmed, there are two common things that we do and they make perfect sense from this perspective when they are looking for information about proprioception, right? Where's my body in space? The thing that we do that gives them the most proprioception and therefore calms them is we swaddle them. Now, again, I remember I said, all sensory systems are different. So there are babies that don't like swaddling, but far and wide, it's much more typical for a baby to like to be swaddled. And the reason is, is it gives their brain so much proprioceptive sense that they feel really calm and secure. Let's look at vestibular. What do you do with a baby who's upset that maybe wants vestibular sense? Not that you're thinking this way. You're just thinking, I need to call my baby. You rock them or you swing them or you vibrate them, right? Those are all things that move their head and their body in space. And so it makes a lot of sense that those big actions help their raw system kind of feel like it has enough information to organize itself, which is truly what calming is. So um, the systems typically get more refined, like I said, as they get older. And for most kiddos, sensory processing develops through the course of ordinary activities, right? Play, moving around, tummy time, reaching for things, putting things in their mouth, like that helps refine all of these systems at, at a certain rate. Now, not all kiddos, some of them have these kind of sensory differences that maybe lets them shy away from certain sensory experiences, or maybe some circumstance has not provided it. But most kiddos can kind of continue to develop their processing that way. Um, but exposure is, is really key. You know, uh, the letting children explore and interact and play, all of that helps them learn. And as we play, we experience more and we get more refined. And you'll hear that theme again, even when your kiddos get older and they maybe have some sensory processing difficulties. Um, okay, I wanted to mention really quick interception. I don't know if you all are familiar or not. It's kind of a newer to the scene sense. Um, it, it probably within the last 10 years, it's really become a lot more, um, talked about, but it, it is, it's actually, um, related to your peripheral nervous system. So the parts of your body inside your body that you don't consciously control, um, 
so sensations like being hungry and being thirsty and your temperature and if you have to go to the bathroom and all of those things are related to your interoception and what interoception tries to do for kiddos who are having trouble with this sense is connect those feelings and emotions with a physiological sensation, a body sensation. So it strives to teach what does a growling stomach feel like? What does a dry mouth feel like? Which is, is a difficult task, but there are some um, one particular nice program out there to teach it. So um, I just wanted to mention that as one of the senses that is part of this sensory processing. So Hopefully, you know, the take home message for this very beginning part is that everyone processes sensory input differently and that's okay, but there is kind of a developmental norm that happens that the more input that children experience, usually the more refined their systems get. Um, so now I have a little video that I'm going to play. I'm hoping it works okay. Um, that just describes one student's perspective. So I, I like that video just because it reminds me, and even though I do this for a living, it's good to be reminded that there are so many other perspectives out there. You know, I'm in a school all the time and a passing period doesn't ever overwhelm me, um, except for as it relates to COVID now, but that the sounds don't typically overwhelm me. And yet um, I don't, probably register the sounds of the locks clinking or the orchestra room, you know, in a different hallway. And so it's kind of beautiful just to remember that we are, we're all coming at this from a different direction. So I think that's a nice video to illustrate that everyone processes sensory input differently and that's okay. I'm going to keep saying that that's okay. However, when we talk about a sensory processing disorder, it's when the inability to take it in or organize it or respond to it in a meaningful and an appropriate way is not possible. So really what the real issue is, is when your sensory processing is getting in the way of something that you need to do. And that's truly, truly the difference. You know, I have examples of kiddos that I either know in my personal life or through work where one was very sensitive to light and his mom got him some special shades uh, for his bedroom. And when it's really sunny out, he wears sunglasses. And when he's inside, he typically is fine. He can just kind of filter it out, right? And I have another girl who had a huge sensitivity to bright light and she got so dizzy that she would collapse to the floor because it was so discombobulating. So it was the same, similar 
anyway, sensory experiences and low, low thresholds for that bright light. But one of them just kind of found a few tools and was able to handle it. And one wasn't. And that's really when it becomes a sensory processing disorder. Um, I just wanted to note at the bottom, you know, you'll hear SI dysfunction, sensory integration dysfunction, um, all, all sorts of acronyms, um, but they're all kind of referring to the same thing. So really it's just that something is getting from a sensory stimuli perspective, something is getting in the way. Um, so the prevalence of sensory processing disorder, um, studies estimate typically about 5% of all kindergartners, right, might come in with um, a sensory processing disorder. I would say that rang really true uh, 10 years ago. I feel like even COVID aside, you know, there, remember what I said, right, like, so our sensory systems become more refined with interaction, exploration, and practice. And um, you know, there's a phenomenon and there's zero judgment here because I've also raised two kids in this time frame and they have plenty of devices, but kids nowadays, even before COVID, were just not out exploring in the environment. And I'm not just talking about outside, outside, I'm talking about everything. Kids know what smartphones are from the time that they're babies. And so where that probably doesn't consider, um, or sorry, does it conclude in a lifetime of difficulties, we do find that kiddos sensory systems are raw more raw when they come into kindergarten now because of the kind of play that they engage in so i think that's interesting um 39 in children that were preterm um that were preemies and that is just like a bunch of the kind of developmental pieces their their sensory systems were just a little bit more delayed than their chronological age and then um, much higher, we see a lot of sensory processing in um, a lot of the other diagnoses, things like developmental delay and ADHD, and of course, autism spectrum disorder. I tried to find a really general study. Um, and really, this is one of the best ones for the last few years. It just said like 40 to 90%. So I think it's very common that if you have a kiddo with autism that you are going to see plenty of signs, whether it is a diagnosed sensory processing disorder or it's just sensory, what you consider, you know, sensory issues like we all have, but maybe they're more prevalent, that's gonna be really common. Um, okay, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I think it's interesting to know because you might hear these words at a pediatrician or, or at a therapist's office. There are three main kinds of diagnosed kind of subcategories. Um, sensory modulation disorder is the most common and that's what we'll really talk about today. It basically just talks about that threshold of being able to take in stimuli and make sense of it, how sometimes it's too much and sometimes it's not enough. Um, sensory discrimination disorder is, a, is a less common, but that would be about less about the ability to take it in and more about the ability to make any sense of it. So for example, these are kiddos who hear a voice and they don't recognize that's their mom's voice, right? So they hear it, but they're not like making sense that that's mom's voice as opposed to some stranger, you know, saying something to them. Or um, a really common one is um, tactile discrimination. So these are kiddos that you know, reach their hand into a bag and, and you say, are you holding a banana or a key or a house key? And they can't answer that question. So they're just having a hard time. Their tactile system might be working on, like at the receptor end, but their brain isn't making sense of all the differences between a banana and a key. Um, and then sensory based motor disorder. Um, nowadays, that's more often being diagnosed as what they call developmental coordination disorder. But that's really when your ability to make sense of sensory stimuli gets in the way of you kind of planning motor movement. So, um, you know, we talked about how your proprioceptive it might make you bump into kids in the hallway, that sort of thing. But these are the more complex motor, you know, you might have a harder time figuring out how to jump or skip or run or those sorts of things. So you might get that diagnosis. Um, okay, I have one more video. This is the only one and it's about five minutes because it's a little kiddo with autism who um, does a really good job. He should be a speaker instead of me, but um, I'm going to play this. And he does a good job of really explaining that sensory modulation disorder in a way that I think it makes sense. Oops. Hi, my name is Neil. I like classical music. I like 
to read comics. I also like to go to school. Something that I know a lot about and want to tell you about is sensory processing disorder. SPD is when the messages that your brain gets from your senses are not organized. So you don't respond to things like most people do. This makes it hard to do everyday life stuff like getting ready for the day, going to school, eating, and playing. You can have SPD by itself or you can have it with other things like autism. I have autism and SPD. Everyone has seven sensory systems. They are sound, taste, smell, vision, touch, proprioceptive, and vestibular. Under-responsive versus over-responsive. You can think of each your sensory systems as being a cup. And water is that type of a sensory input. If you are under-responsive to a certain sensory input, it is like you're a big, huge cup. You keep getting water to the big cup. You can just keep adding and adding, but it never feels full. But if you are over-responsive, it is like you are a tiny cup. All you need is just a little sensory input and you overflow. You want your cup to be full and not spill over. Each of your sensory systems is their own cup and they are different sizes. Just because you have one big cup does not mean you are under-responsive with all your senses. I have a big cup for my proprioceptive and vestibular senses and a little cup for my touch, sound, taste, and smell senses. Everyone is a different and unique. Some days and times of days are good, and some are too much for me. I don't like loud and busy places. I cover my ears and want to run away or yell and tell everyone to be quiet. I need less noise to feel in control of my body. I like to always be moving. I have a hard time holding still. I don't like people to touch my skin sometimes. But everyone is different. My brother doesn't mind if people touch him and he does not need to wear sunglasses. It is important to know your own body and to understand your body and your seven senses. Sound. All right, I'm going to All right. So, under-responsive or over-responsive, those are terms that um, are important to think about. So the hyper-responsive, I don't know if people have come across this in like medical paperwork, but they do the hyper-hypo and you have to go, wait, wait which, one is, which one is too much and which one is too little? Um, and so I also used over-responsive and under-responsive. So over-responsive means just that. You over-respond to something that is seemingly small or normal. Um, so those kiddos, the nervous system is getting too much. They need less. They need the reduction of sound, the reduc reduction of what they're looking at, whatever the case may be. And then over or under-responsive kiddos are that big huge cup and they're just never full right this is a little bit more in line with what i described with early development they are looking for a lot so that they feel it and they can recognize it right and so um that is kind of an important thing to look at when you're trying to understand the way that your child or a child is reacting to something is, are they under responsive or over responsive? And then of course, which system is it that is taxed at this moment? So I put, why are we acting like, why are they acting like that? Because I, I do think that's the case. I mean, first of all, as a parent, we think that about our kids all the time, but specifically when it comes to sensory processing, it doesn't make sense. Remember there's there's a completely different lens they're coming from. And, you know, so sensory is, is everything that we take in and we're taking it in all the time, all around, not just, you know, one clear signal. Behavior is how we respond. And then our emotions 
are a state of feeling that influence the thought of behavior. But we have emotions about the stimuli and we have emotions about that affect how we behave. And then we have emotions about what happens when we behave. So really it, we oh, sorry. Sorry. So yeah. first asked, can a child be both? I feel like my child's both. Yes. Yes. So sense part one um, indicator of sensory modulation, like the child in the video talked about, oh, this system is always this and this. Some kiddos are like that kind of a pendulum given the day, right? So they might wake up and they want movement all the time. And then the next moment they might be scared to go on the slide. So yes, absolutely. That can happen. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about how you handle that and how part of it is about regulation, which is kind of a bigger lens about understanding how they're feeling. Um, okay. But in terms of kind of all the interplay that is happening, remember that the level of control, especially for young, young kids that don't yet kind of aren't trying to approach that regular, like understanding regulation a little bit it's really hard for them to under, to differentiate out that all of this started because of one sensory stimuli. Um, I wrote, you know, have you ever engaged, engaged in an unhelpful response? So I have this example of how your sensory system and your emotions and your behavior are sometimes kind of spiraling out of control, but in a normal way. So if anyone's ever driven on one of those days or nights, it's always a night where the rain is just driving rain and you feel like, oh my gosh, this it maybe is so, the rain is so hard, it's not even safe to drive. Inevitably, if that happens to me, I have kids in the car and I'm worried. I'm really worried that it's not safe, but maybe I don't know where I'm gonna pull over or I'm worried about what happens if I don't keep going. And the first thing I always do is turn off the radio right, which is hilarious because the sound has nothing to do with the safety of the driving, but it is sensory stimuli that your brain is telling you, you cannot process that right now. You just need to, you just need to be quiet. And then I, you know, if you're a nice mom, you say shh to the kids, but I usually like, you guys gotta be quiet, right? And, and I, so I have this behavior that's maybe uncalled for and my emotions are sky high, but None of that makes any sense, but it's all interconnected, right? I couldn't if I wanted to change that cycle when that happens. And so I just want to, um, you know, kind of draw your attention to that. And we'll talk about it in a little bit more depth about all those interplaying factors. Okay, we have one more question. Yeah. So someone said, may I know, is a kid with sensory that is under responsive the same as the kid who is sensory seeking? Yes, yes. Um, under responsive means you don't get enough, so you're seeking it. Yes, very much. So there's a test. There's a um, the sensory profile is a common test, and it it puts you under as a sensory seeker or a sensory avoider, and then it talks about registration and bystander, which are a little bit more complex. But yes, absolutely, being under responsive and a sensory seeker are the same things. Um, so this slide is that good, Kimmy? Okay, um, so the self-regulation is the same thing we've been talking about, right? Sensory processing and then our behavior, how we behave and then our emotions, but it's taking even a further step back because I can't tell you how simplistic even these models are compared to the way that your brain works. So I drew, you know, we are self-regulating, which is like I said, a bigger lens. So it's not about like, processing and making sense of it. It's about taking it in, processing it, making sense of it, making good decisions, problem solving when something goes wrong, and then changing your behavior, which is really complex. And I listed all the kind of big, I mean, there are entire disciplines about sensory processing, and then executive functioning is a piece of that. And what that is, is your frontal lobe, your prefrontal cortex is what does all of the decision making really for your, your body. That's the thing that has absolutely no utilization in toddlers, but by the time you're an adult, it often can kind of filter a response or decide that instead of, you know, going to the bar, you should probably do your work, like that sort of thing. Um, so executive function, there's emotional control. We talked about emotions, but then, you know, that your emotions are in your limbic system, which has a whole nother set of complicated terms and loops about how that works. There's your behavioral feedback loop, which it means when you get stimuli and then you do a behavior, 
then something happens and that either changes your behavior or it reinforces your behavior. And so there's that concept. And then finally, social cognition is probably something that, you know, is talked about a lot in the autism world. And it's, it's like being aware that it's not appropriate. Even though I really don't like styrofoam, I can't put my hands in my ear and start screaming at work because that's not a social norm there. So there really are a lot of things. And then at the bottom, I listed even you know more technical concepts that fall under those categories like metacognition. So your awareness of your awareness and social attention and interpretation. So like when you see something social, how do you make sense of it in a way that makes sense? Problem solving, motivation, et cetera. So I, I, I'm kind of, blurting out a lot of words, but what I think the main idea here is sensory processing is a piece of self-regulation. And a lot of times for kids with autism with sensory processing disorder, it's a big part of self-regulation. And self-regulation is really what makes the world go round. You know, I said, we're always self-regulating, managing feelings through reactions to sensory stimuli and behavior to accomplish goals. That doesn't mean like get a promotion goal. That means like put on your socks goal, right? Like we have to self-regulate all the time, all day as well to be able to get anything done. And so a lot of times when you see kiddos in a state where they're just not even, they don't know which way's up and they're having really trouble, a lot of trouble getting back to whatever they're doing. It is the self-regulation, kind of all of these processes are kind of in, in a groove to get going again. Um, okay, so yes. Okay, so I wanna talk briefly in case people are not getting occupational therapy or they're not familiar with it, just about kind of why I'm talking about it. It's supposed to maybe a different um, profession. So we are typically the ones who will do some assessing. So there are, you know, somebody mentioned sensory seeking. There are some tests out there that are pretty common. Um, OTs promote universal tools. There are a lot of universal tools. You know, my um, oldest daughter just went to a homecoming dance and they have a quiet gym, right? And that's a universal tool. The point is, even though kids are specifically going to the dance, that it's too much of a sensory experience for a lot of them, right? So universe, other universal tools are things like teachers or parents talking about what the day, what, what's gonna happen that day, right? So giving some predictability, um, using visuals when kids are having a hard time processing, like those are all universal tools. Um, for structure or, or calming. That's another one, right? There's not a kid alive right now that does not benefit for some mindfulness and calming just because we're all pretty stressed out um, a lot of times these days. Um, an OT will work to identify triggers, um, adapt the environment is a big part of what we do, right? I mean, hopefully you've gotten from the previous slides is that we're all different and that's okay. And we can keep exploring and interacting, but we also can't control where we are on that spectrum without some work. So adapting the environment is a, per a perfect kind of example for these kiddos. Um, providing sensory tools. Um, there are all kinds of tools that will provide the different sensory experiences that kids want. A sensory diet is really like kind of a specific formula for a kiddo. And then of course, educating the other people in this kid's life um, to help them. So that's kind of an OT um, perspective. So I wanna talk a little bit about self-regulation models. I believe that everyone should be on a self-regulation model. <laughs> And the reason is this is taking an hour for us, a bunch of adults to even explain. So how can we teach? And we do know from research that when kids are invested and interested, they are more likely to learn, right? And so how can we teach kids about all of this stuff, about their behavior and about sensory and about, um, and about emotions if we don't have a kind of a, a vehicle to do that? And there are some great ones out there that I'm going to tell you about. Um, and I think they're good for all children's and adolescents. I don't know. My kids are adolescents, so I don't know if they're good for young adults too, but they're good for me. They're good for my husband. We use a lot of language from these models just because it's, it's, it's really nice. You know, my second point, it gives common neutral language. If you start assigning positivity and negativity to certain reactions that kids can't control, right? We know that kind of sets you up for a much harder road than if you can acknowledge what something is and then try to move in an adaptive way. So um, 
also, you know, a lot of kiddos with autism are going to get a, a services, whether they're in school yet or not. And it is a really nice way because a, a social worker and a counselor and a speech path and an OT and a PT, guess what? They're all going to need to address self-regulation at some point. So if they have a program where they're using the same terms with a kiddo, they are going to learn a lot um, and, and kind of build awareness, which is the last point, is that um, even, and that is not just for um kiddos that have a certain cognition or kiddos that have a certain language level. I mean, all kiddos, and I've seen it done with all kinds of kiddos, like there is a way to identify and then address and then know what the next step is. And that's kind of what these self-regulation models are about, um, making it more digestible to really talk about it. So let's see. Maybe sure I talked about. It. Okay, so I'm just going to go through a few. Um, some of them might have, you know, they they might sound familiar or not. Um, I think there's value in every one that I'm going to tell you about. Um, the zones of regulation is really common in the OT world. It does not just identify emotion. So you can see their zones, blue, green, yellow, red, and they kind of have emotions tied to them. They really are more about physiological states, right? So there are, there are a couple of things that we've already talked about that, that are keyed in there. So it's not just when you're sad, you're in the blue zone, because that might not have a lot of value on its own. It's what does your body look like when you're sick or tired or sad and starting to draw the comparison that low energy, right, looks blue regardless of your emotion. And similarly, if you have, if you're kind of agitated or really excited, those can impact your kind of focus and calm in the same way. Um, and then, of course, the um, program talks about tools, right? So if you, it's okay to be in the yellow zone and screaming with excitement at a birthday party, but it's not so appropriate in math class, right? Or, or gym and recess, you're in yellow. And so it just kind of talks about how you get from one to the other. Um, the alert program is a little bit old school and it's really all about energy. It's about an engine. So a lot of times I'll have a lot of success with a kiddo that really likes cars um, because you have a too, a too high engine and a too low engine and then just right. Um, but it also does a nice job of exploring how sensory tools within each sense kind of revs you up or brings you down. So what you might learn, hey, me eating some pretzels, some crunchy, salty snack brings me up a little bit. But if I have some aromatherapy smell, I might come down a little bit. So it's all about using that kind of too high, too low. Um, sensational brain or brain works is actually rooted in kinetic or exercise science, which I think is really interesting. But when you think about it, our physiological state, when you take the emotions out of it, right, is really adaptable. Like we can, we can make our heart race or we can make our, breathe, our, our heart be slower. Um, and, but it uses these kinds of tools and that physiological exercise piece with this dial you can see on the left that kind of has the same too high, too low version. Um, and she has a really nice site with a lot of free options as well. Um, hopefully, well, I, I love social thinking. This is Michelle Garcia winner who does so much great work in autism. Um, they're very tuned in to autism and social awareness. And actually all of social thinking does a ton for kiddos with autism, but are not as sensory related, except for this unthinkables. There really is a nice self-regulation. There's, there's, sorry, there's self-regulation layered throughout social thinking, but the sensory processing piece of the unthinkables is really nice. So all of a sudden, when you use a character like the space invaders to explain somebody who doesn't have good proprioceptive sense, then you have a little bit more work on, on kind of where to go from there. Um, this book, I highly recommend. In fact, most you know, national speakers are just talking about, it. it's not really a program, it just, it was a book, um, but it has created kind of inadvertently a really good way to talk about things. So the main part of the whole brain child is the downstairs brain and the upstairs brain. And the downstairs brain is like the key, like it keeps you breathing and those basic functions, but it's also your impulse and your limbics, your emotion, right? And all that stuff comes and your downstairs brain gets it all. 
But the idea is you got to start sending it up to the upstairs brain, right? That's the whole kind of theory behind it is if you send it upstairs first, then you're sure that you can maybe have a little bit more control, which is really what it's about. Um, and again, I know that I'm not going into the details of how you would adapt this. And I'm talking about it, obviously, as adults, but there really are some great visuals out there that helps make it kind of appropriate to all. I mean, I have 21 year olds that use zones and I have three year olds that have, uh, you know, some of the more complex ones and, and everything in between in terms of language and understanding. So um, there's some really nice systems for that. And then um, conscious discipline is another one. So this kind of was born out of a school program like classroom management, um, but I just looked at the website and it does have a nice parent tab as well. And this is really more of an emotional slant. So it's naming your emotions and then regulating, which is those four characters at the bottom are kinds of calming breaths. There's the star breath, the balloon breath, the faucet and the pretzel, um, and then solve problems, right? So it's social emotional. Um, in nature, but what it does is it talks about, you know, you look really upset, you must be, you know, there's like this car reference, like your, your brain's in the trunk today, so you can't do it. So that's another nice program. Um, and all, like I said, all of these, I have, you know, there have been kiddos where I've had to go through two before I found one that really resonated, two or three, um, but I have seen value out of all of them. So um, I'm a little bit behind, so I'm going to move a little bit quicker. Um, I have some strategies, and again, um, you know, somebody asked about the sensory seeking. So the first, the one on the left, the over-responsive is avoiders, and you usually you can see things like avoid, and then the under-responsive or the right side are the are the sensory seekers. So um, a kiddo who is really responsive, um, really over-responsive to touch firm touch is better, right? So I would never just like run, like just tap his arm. I might like go in his sight, let him see, and then firmly, if I have to touch him, um, warning them before touching them, structuring space so they have less touch. There are so many great clothing companies that have come about lately that ha don't have tags. I've certainly had my fair share of kids who wear, you know, uh, sundresses through all the winter months because then nothing's touching their legs. Um, under responsive, so these are kids who, it's not that they don't want to be messy. It's that they want to be messy. They want to be in the bottle of shaving cream at all times, right? So they want to touch everything, in which case, what do we know? We know that we learn to become more refined the more we do it. So you're giving them things to touch. You're letting them do putty while they're trying to do something else. Lotion, like tickles, gum, water bottle, all that sort of thing. Um, a visual system. So we talked a little bit about that, about sunglasses or decreasing the clutter in the room. We do a lot of that at school. Um, under responsive, this is a little less common that kiddos really need a lot visually because usually there's plenty visually in somewhere in the environment, but bright lights. Um, I have had kiddos where we have to put the important messages on the wall in red. So they wouldn't attend to like all the details, but if you put something in red, then they knew they had to pay attention to it. Um, auditory system. So kiddos, you know, that's very common with autism that they don't like the loud noises, um, specifically unpredictable loud noises. So headphones, quiet environment, um, white noise fans, certainly letting them know it's coming. We do a lot of very slow incremental trying with those difficult stimuli. Um, under responsive. So these are kids who, you know what they look like a lot? They hum all the time. It's like they don't have enough going on in their ears, so they've got to create it, right? Those are kids that they're like, uh, and you're kind of like, is that a, what, where is that coming from? That's where I most come and see it is they're constantly making a noise because they want to hear the noise. Um, so listening to loud music, um, establishing eye contact before you're saying something important, because otherwise it's just, it's all like just background noise for them. Um, vestibular, so you will know if you have a kiddo that is gravitationally insecure, they won't want to go off curbs, they won't want to go upstairs to a slide, they won't want to get on a swing. Um, and that is a slow and steady, just very small, small trials in a predictable way, um, usually with a reward afterwards. Um, and then under responsive, those, those are the kids that are the movers and shakers. They, they 
you know, want to be on their head while they're watching TV, um, or they are constantly looking for movement where you didn't know it um, existed. And again, remember, we're giving them more, we're giving them more opportunities for movement. Um, and then proprioceptive is um, the last sense that we're talking about. It's actually really rare that somebody is over responsive to proprioception because we just be it, we're we're just in the world standing. We have our proprioceptive sense working, um, but under responsive is very common. So these are the crashers. They don't look coordinated. They're always moving as well, but they're they're um, they're clompers. They walk down the street or down the hallway, and they're like like there are lead shoes on them. Um, and you're just giving them more, you know, you're giving them more complicated movements. And, and actually the key is for extra proprioception is to use as many systems as once, have them hold something while they're looking at something different, while they're moving with their other hand, while their leg is, you know, folded, you know, under them or something. Um, and then I just wanted to note the, you know, the heavy work, hopefully you have heard somewhere if you're, if your kiddo is in a, in a preschool or a school, that is often just the gold standard. We don't know why it, for people who tend to have the big cup, it fills them up to give them heavy work because they're moving all their joints and they're, you know, usually moving their vestibular system as well. Um, and for kid, for kiddos who are, are under risk of the very little cup, it's calming. I don't know why. I think that goes back to the exercise science that eventually we just kind of slow down when we just get input to our muscles. But um, that's kind of heavy work is like the blanket answer that should work with everybody. Um, so any take home messages? I, you know, no two people are the same, whether they have sensory processing disorder or not when it comes to that, you know, make sure and provide or reduce. I talked a lot about how they grow, you know, how an OT or, or how anyone can grow in their sensory processing and their kind of organization of it. But you have to be adaptive, right? Like it would never be helpful for a child who's really overly responsive to vestibular to make them sit on a swing for 20 minutes. That would never be helpful. They have to feel like they can handle it and like they're in control and then feel the resilience that comes afterwards. And they have to, they have to be able to give input as you go. So remember to be adaptive. That being said, the world is crazy. And sometimes your kid that hates loud noises ends up next to the fire truck, right? So, so also have compassion with yourself because it's impossible to control the whole world. Um, be proactive and not reactive. And there is a lot of research that certain sensory experiences through the day mean that we never get to that meltdown spot, even when we don't, you know, as opposed to kiddos who are teetering and, oh, they don't need that help, right? It's kind of like visuals, like, oh, they're great. They don't need help anymore. Sometimes it's better just to give them those breaks anyway, in the same way that you or I on a tough work day, like we would just be in a little better place if we could take a few mental breaks. Um, responsive to tools are individual and then best default tools when your kiddo is having a really hard time from a sensory experience is heavy work and deep breaths. So that is all I wrote uh, my email. I think Kimmy can um, share anything as well. And I have my references and that is all I have for you. So if anyone has any questions.